Good evening. I'm Casey Nolan, and I would like you to imagine for just a moment that we are building a house. And instead of a general contractor to oversee our project, we're going to buy electri electrical outlets based on however many an electrician recommends. We'll have our cabinet maker recommend and build as many cabinets as he wants, and our plumber can recommend and put in all the faucets he wants. Now, we shouldn't be surprised if our house has too many of all of those, cost more than we expected, and it might just fall down in a couple of years. Well, tonight we have some healthcare professionals who say that house is our healthcare system and that contractor we should have hired, well, that is a primary care physician. They care for your common aches and pains, and while they are in high demand, their numbers are dwindling. Like One study predicts America will be 50,000 primary care doctors short Aww. of what they need in the next decade. And as the Affordable Care Act and new insurance exchanges start to offer more affordable health care to more Americans, many providers worry about the risk of overwhelming an already burdened workforce. So what are the solutions? How are local health care providers already supplementing primary care? And why should you be going to the doctor even when you're not sick? All this and more tonight, so stay tuned. Tonight we have a doctor in the house, quite a few actually. We also have some experts and we also have some patients in tonight's show thanks to something called PEN. It's not just reporters and editors involved in covering tough community issues anymore. We have something called the Public Insight Network or PEN where we invite contributors from around the region to share their expertise, concerns, insights and stories which can be incorporated into our coverage. When you share your insights, you become part of a network of involved citizens who help us gain a broader perspective. So please, share your knowledge with Penn. Okay, I have to confess, that analogy wasn't mine. I stole that, and hopefully it, hopefully it worked. Uh, here to start us off tonight is Dr. Doug Pogue, BJC, Medical Director of Accountable Care at BJC, Associate Chief of Medicine at Missouri Baptist. So uh, let's start kind of in that range. I don't know if that was a good analogy or not, but tell us, let's make sure we're on the, on the same page. What is a primary care physician? Right, well, it's, it's, it's simply put, a primary care office is where most people get most of their health care. Um, it serves as sort of their medical home, the, the founding base where they, all of their other medical decisions can be made. The one thing that's unique about primary care is that it doesn't just offer a medical service that's available when someone happens to need it. It offers a relationship. And so that relationship lasts years and sometimes decades um, and takes people through the whole course of their life, all the ups and downs, and it provides this vital context to which you can really speak into their medical problems. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that happens over and over again is I'll walk into an emergency room with one of my patients that happens to be there, and the response is, oh, thank God you're here. Now, why would they say that? They, they would say that because I know them, because they know that here's someone who knows me inside and out, who's been with me through thick and thin, and even if they can't articulate it, they know that if, if that person is here, then the diagnosis is going to be more accurate and correct for them. The treatments will be in line with may, many other medicines they're taking or other treatments they're getting. They're not going to get something they're allergic to or mm -hmm. some other problem. They're going to be well taken care of because of that relationship. That's, that's, kind of cool. that's how the doctor sees it. Let's, think, let's talk about how the patient sees it using the pen. And, and we ask people, why do you go to a primary care physician? Here's what they said. We asked you the main reasons you visit your primary care provider. Here are some of the responses. I go to maintain my health and to treat acute illnesses. When I've put more effort into prevention, the visits that I need to treat acute illness have dramatically dropped. I go to see my primary care doctor as little as possible, essentially only when I am so ill I can hardly pull myself out of bed. I'm over 50 and I need to maintain regular checkups for my continued health concerns. I visit my primary care physician when there is something wrong. I see her less than once a year because of my own difficulties accessing safe, affordable transportation. I refuse screening for cancer because I already struggle just to survive on Social Security and disability. 
Now, I have to say it's odd that all of those people have a voice that sounds very similar, but we'll, right. we'll get past that. Uh, does any of that uh, ring true to you? I mean, you're talking about a, a very uh, positive view of what all can come from a primary care physician, but we got mm -hmm. folks there saying, I go as little as possible. Well, right, so you, the, a couple things need to be true. You need to be comfortable where you are. You need to have a physician that you trust, that you have a good relationship with, that you can speak with openly. Um, when you have that kind of relationship, people tend to go. Um, the other issue is really prevention is everything. You know, it, it's, it, nothing is more powerful than decisions you and I and everybody in the audience here make every day that impact our health. Foods that we eat, other choices and decisions we make, um, that mixed with, with, you know, structured screening in a professional way by somebody who knows what they're doing has a dramatic impact on how healthy and well people will be over time. Um, waiting until the one, uh, the one um, uh, typist uh, uh, said, until I'm just, I can't, crawl out of bed and I'll finally go. We can help him, but we couldn't help him nearly as much as we would have been able to had we been able to head that off so we never was in that position to begin with. Okay, so is that relationship changing then? Is it, I don't know, getting worse, falling apart a little bit? Well, actually, I, I think some of them are getting closer, but there's there's a change in, in nationally how we treat primary care. People are starting to realize and get back to basics that, that primary care really matters. And there's a mountain of, of evidence out there that, that if people have access to good, high quality primary care, they'll get sick less often. When they get sick, they get better faster. They stay healthier longer. They have fewer safety errors, you know, bad medicines or things that, that cause problems with them. Um, their satisfaction with their health care and how well they're being taken care of goes through the roof. And all of that costs less than what we're doing now with having, as you mentioned, different contractors all, all uh, uh, trying to treat the right. same patient in a random kind of way. Can, uh, give me one more definition uh, before we move forward tonight. Accountable care organization, that's something I know you work with. What, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? What, what, right. what is accountable care organization? Right, so an accountable care organization is a group of, of providers that have gotten together and are dedicated to try to improve the health status of our senior patients, those who are on Medicare and uh, benefit from Medicare. And so we try to do a couple things. We try to give them better and more coordinated health care. We try to make the information about them more transparent and portable. And what I mean by that is, uh, take the example I just put in, where I walk into an emergency room and the patient says, ah, there's the guy who knows me. Well, what if, what if that context, the information about somebody, would travel with them wherever they went into the health center? So no matter who touched them in different aspects of their health care, that information goes with them. So everybody now kind of knows them instead of somebody simply being good at their job but having no idea about, about the individual person. So if we do that, we surround, we surround folks with information and knowledge, we provide that to all the people who are touching them, you're going to get more informed and better decisions. That leads to better health care. And it, interestingly enough, it's cheaper. Dr. Pogue, thank you so much, but don't go anywhere. We want, we're going to have you back in the show a little bit later. There's a lot more we have to talk about. Great, we appreciate your time. And before we move on in the show, though, we want to make sure your voice is in tonight's show. And Ed Reggie is here. Ed, tell us how that's going to work, please. Well, thanks, Casey. In fact, that's right. Your voice does make a difference. In fact, here at Stay Tuned, your voice drives the conversation. And I'm the one listening through, to you throughout the entire broadcast. In fact, earlier this week, I posted there out on our Facebook and on Twitter, uh, what kind of primary care physician services do you look for? Do you have a primary care doctor? And you answered. We are hearing actually tonight from people talking about uh, how insurance plays a role on uh, who, what primary care physician they actually get. So uh, there's two ways you can join in the conversation. One, you could go to our Facebook page, The Nine Network. Uh, we put a question up there earlier this afternoon, and you can actually put your personal story or comments right there. Or you could join us on Twitter using the hashtag StayTunedSTL. Let's see what you're already saying. Okay, now we're going to talk about accessibility. Let me do introductions first, please. Uh, first, we have Dave Campbell with the Institute for Family Medicine, who has uh, found some creative ways that we may hear about for uh, folks to get primary care, access to primary care physicians. Also with us, Maria Snell, a nurse practitioner. I think that's something we're going to hear a lot about tonight as we go forward with the Betty Jean Kerr People's Health Centers. 
and Alan Freeman from Grace Hill Health Centers. A lot of experience in uh, rural hospitals, I believe you do. So I think that's another topic that's going to come up a lot tonight. Before we get started, though, let's go back to that little thing we call PEN to hear what folks have had to say so far. We also asked you about the accessibility of primary care. I think wait times for new patients can be quite long considering that most people seek primary care during times of acute illness. Specifically, people with Medicaid have very limited options and appointments can be months out. I live in a rural area 40 miles from St. Louis. If I needed emergency care, the closest hospital is 15 minutes away. I drive 45 minutes at best for my primary physician. The community needs more primary care doctors, especially that will treat a patient without frequently referring them to a specialist. Doctors' office buildings are filled with specialists, but it's difficult to locate primary care. While there seems to be a fair number in my area, I am severely limited on the number I can choose from. This leaves me in a medical bind, stuck with someone I feel can't give me the care I need. One of the healthcare professionals I see on a regular basis communicates with me via Skype from Colorado Springs though I initially began seeing her in St. Louis. Not a problem that I'm aware of. A lot of good responses on the pen. We really appreciate that. Okay, so let's start with who, Dave, who is lacking access to a primary care physician? Well, I think in the, in the urban setting, you can look at it a couple different ways. I mean, the, the main group that we're talking about are those without insurance or those with perhaps with Medicaid, which where the, there's not enough providers accepting Medicaid. But if you look at it more demographically, you're, you're looking at the lower socioeconomic groups, probably the minorities, and also refugees uh, as, as probably the groups that are having the greatest difficulty with access. Rural areas, isolated areas, and the urban core, of course, as Dr. Campbell was explaining, that's where access is, is a problem. Access can mean geographic disparity. Access can mean lack of insurance coverage. There are a lot of ways to define access, and a lot of Missourians have inadequate access to health care. Okay, so what does that mean? What, what does access, lack of it mean? Sure, it, it's not even, uh, you know, like Alan mentioned here, uh, transportation issues, it, which it is also a transportation issue, but really um, numbers of providers. So I know that we speak about physicians a lot, but it's, you know, primary care providers in, includes nurse practitioners in that as well, which is important to note. Um, and, and in my clinic in particular, we have you know, two to three month wait lists for new patients, which is unacceptable. And is that, is that getting better? I think I know the answer to that, but I set you up with a, it's a soft one there. No. No. <laughs> Not, getting better. Not improving, no. no. We're, we're seeing fewer and fewer people go into primary care for various reasons. And this is creating uh, an inadequate supply of individuals to provide primary and preventive care in the population. I think you would you know, agree We're with starting that. with yes. a shortage and uh, in, in sort of broad numbers, uh, studies would say that uh, in, if you're trying to provide universal access, you need at least 50% of your physicians to be primary care. We have about less than a third. And only 25% of graduates coming out of medical school are going into primary care, so that's not going to be a way to catch up. So what else are people missing out on? Let's go back to the rural area for mm -hmm. a minute. The, the, what other roles does a primary care provider play besides just, I'm, I'm getting it, is, there, is mental health a factor? In? Mm -hmm. uh, physicians and advanced practice nurses in rural areas perform a number of tasks to improve health status. Uh, it's not just uh, seeing a person in an exam room. So there's an insufficient number of dentists, for example, in the state. And mental health, as you mentioned, is a real problem in the state of Missouri. There is just an insufficient number of psychiatrists, LCSWs, and others to provide that care. So it's not just in the rural area. We're talking about the rural area and the urban core. It's, it's a fairly wide disparity. I, would, I think mm -hmm. that's true, wouldn't you? Well, we struggle every day to try to meet the demands in our clinic for mental health services. Uh, it's, a, it's a struggle. Yes. And I'd like to make the point about mental health we were talking about earlier that uh, the insurance companies have sort of carved out mental health and, and, and created a, uh, a division between primary care and mental health. 
uh, if, if some, one of my patients needs a, a GI procedure, I recommend the gastroenterologist, we make the referral, we get the report back, we discuss it with them. If someone mm -hmm. needs mental health services, it's, well, turn over your insurance card if they have one. Turn over your insurance card and look at the, the number there because insurance companies have sort of driven things that direction. And, and so are primary care providers taxed even more if that is their role in the rural area? And are they, are they qualified to, to, do, to, to take on this task? Well, uh, certainly they're qualified. Uh, the, the question is how much of their practice do they want to devote to different aspects of care? Uh, integration of primary care and behavioral health care, for example. A number of primary care providers would feel comfortable doing a certain level of behavioral health care uh, perhaps in their practice, but their practices get overrun with uh, so many other, the, the capacity is limited, so many other needs of the patient population. And again, it gets back to a workforce shortage. Uh, talk about health literacy. Uh, what, what do we mean by that and how does that play a role in what we're talking about here tonight? I think that that's, that's a good question. And in the community health centers that you know a lot of us here represent, um, we, we are really trying to educate our patients on primary care, access to care resources, what they need to know to better their health and improve their health outcomes. And um, it, a big push right now, I know in our health center, and I'm sure in, in yours as well, um, is uh, teams of people to educate these patients and the focus is, on education is to improve their, their knowledge of their condition and what they can do to better themselves and improve their outcomes. You think about literacy in terms of reading, we're really talking about understanding, understanding right. the healthcare system and how to access it. And, uh, you know, educating and, as, as mm -hmm. uh, Maria was talking about, uh, people to actually guide folks is really what's needed. So they're not waiting until they can barely pull themselves uh, the out The term of today is patient navigation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's care management, case management, helping people uh, guide, guide people through the morass that is the complex health care system. Are your health outcomes actually better if you just have a primary health care provider in your life on a regular basis? Or, or do we actually see this in a, in a play out in a positive way? I, I think that you do. I think if you have that solid relationship with the provider that can guide you and keep you on the right path, and, and with a team of people, it's not just one person. That's important to note. And, and back to your analogy, it, it's, it's not only a, a better outcome, it's also lower cost. Okay, so how do we fix it? We have about 90 seconds, or about <laughs> 60 seconds in this segment. Can you fix it in that time? People need to establish a patient-centered medical home location and they need to regularly go to their provider so that the provider can help them to maintain a higher quality of life and health status over a longer period. This keeps people out of the emergency department. It helps to avoid acute illness down the road. It's just the best way. But we just saw a lot of people in the, on the pin there saying that that's not possible for them. How do we make it easier for them? So we decrease barriers to care. I feel that making more liberal practice for nurse practitioners will be the way to do that. It's, it's the way of the future. It's the way of the world. It's something and, we need to embrace. Yeah, and I think that we, we're talking about uh, access and again kind of focusing a little bit on location and it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. It's also, and, and Dr. Pogue mentioned this in his comments, trust. Uh, that, that's one of the largest barriers, and particularly in the, in the lower socioeconomic groups that we we're talking about having difficulty with. Okay, we gotta leave, we, we'll, we'll come back, we'll leave it there for one second because we have a guest coming up that was, uh, has been on the show before, but before we talk to Dr. Heidi Miller and some others, we wanna show you a day in the life of a doctor. Hi, Ms. Moore. Do you need refills on any of your medicines? Hello there. I'm Dr. Heidi Miller. And I'm a primary care doctor. I work at the Family Care Health Centers, which is a federally qualified health center. Um, we take care of patients regardless of their ability to pay. Our doors are open to everyone. And just relax, relax his shoulder. Every single patient that I have on the schedule today is complicated. And when I was a brand new doctor out of residency, it was very overwhelming. However, most of these patients I've taken care of for 10 years. So even though I only have 10 to 20 minutes to take care of each patient, I can actually do that with the help of my team members and the fact that we have continuity and I know what's most important to take care of that day. Whereas if someone has to end up going to the emergency room, every time they go, they have a new doctor who doesn't know them at all and has, has to start from scratch. How much weight do you think you've lost from the beginning? Uh, over 
50 pounds. Amazing. 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 <laughs> now, it is very important to keep the access to primary care available to everyone, but it's a particular concern for Medicaid because many, many private practitioners will not accept Medicaid patients right now because of a number of reasons, one of which the current reimbursement is too low, and therefore that's limited access. There is a primary care shortage nationally and regionally. Um, and the interesting thing is that as Medicaid expansion is starting to ripple across the state, those states that are definitely expanding Medicaid are actively recruiting primary care doctors. Let's go check in on Mr. Cross again. There are physicians from Missouri that are currently being recruited out of Missouri by states that already know they're going to do this and they need primary care doctors to take the job. So that means that locally our primary care shortage could worsen. Okay, we're back to talk more about that shortage that we kind of talked about, just we touched on just for a minute. First, introductions. Uh, first, we have with us Dr. Michael Bly from the Goldfarb School of Nursing, also back at the table who you just saw there, Dr. Heidi Miller, Family Care, Care Health Centers and Dr. Doug Pogue, back from the first part of the show, you'll recognize him. And with us tonight is James Sandler, nurse practitioner with the Downtown Urgent Care and also out in Eureka. So we talked just a little bit there about the urban core and rural, so we'll get your perspective on both of those. But I wanna know, why do we have a shortage of primary care providers? Don't be shy. There's a number of reasons, a couple, a couple things. One is, um, if you think back to doctor shows in the 80s and 90s, when, when young people are otherwise looking at TV and c catching a vision for what they might want to do with their lives, nobody ever talks about primary care. It's always the dramatic stuff, right? It's, it's ER, it's emergency surgeries, it's the heart valves, it's all the stuff that, that young people look at and say, wow, I want to do that someday. Prestige. Prestige. Sec second thing is, is there's a big monetary problem uh, in medicine. We've, we've, we think that we've got a real priority on primary care, yet we allocate all our resources to a lot of heavy specialty type of stuff. So when all of the resources are going to you know, hip implants and, and cardioverters that you implant in people's chests and other things like that, you get a medical student who's gone through medical school, they like a lot of different things that they've seen, and then they're trying to make a decision what they want to do with their lives. They say, well, I can make this amount of money doing primary care, or I can make twice doing this, or I can make four times as much doing something else. I mean, these are smart people to begin with, right? So they start looking at that and they say, well, I like this too, so why don't I go do this? And have all and of those specializations, and they've all paid about the same for medical school. It's not like you're paying less for correct. medical school to be a primary care physician, correct? Correct. That's exactly right. And I think it's, it's fair to say too that social demographics are really truly shifting in a way with um, the baby boomers going through. Um, we're living longer. All of the technologies that have supported healthcare, um, actually it's illness care more than it's healthcare, but all of the specialties that have done that work up to and including the cost that we spend at the end of life, which is very dramatic in terms of where we're spending a lot of money for really truly some futile patients. Um, we've got to come to rebalance that and recalibrate that. So I think there's simply more people living longer um, who have a lot more multiple polychronic conditions um, that really make the important role of the primary care provider really critical at this juncture. I think one of the challenges is that primary care providers are being asked to do so much more with less time and less money. I was very, very lucky to know a, an elderly physician in his 90s, Dr. Jerry Flance, before he died. And he spent an hour with a new patient and a half an hour with the follow-ups, and he had an incredible relationship with his patients. I am expected to see patients every 15 minutes. They are very complex. And in one appointment, I'll be expected to address the knee injection, the depression, uh, patient's got a trigger finger, and the reimbursement for that visit, you know, for the medical evaluation part, the reimbursement might be about 100 bucks. But if one of those three specialists from those three specialties saw the patient for one issue, their reimbursement would be, would be more. It would be sometimes a factor of two to three times more. So imagine the pressure on a physician or a nurse practitioner trying to do that 
I'm sorry, but that's really hard work. And it takes its toll after a period of time. And I think the public is generally aware of that. And certainly nurse practitioners and physicians going into primary care, they know what they're signing up for. And it's and not it's good for the sorry to interrupt. It's yeah. not good for the patient either. I mean, it's stressful for the provider, but the patient is not getting the attention that he or she needs. Uh, with those complexities, uh, you simply can't attend to everything, and something's going to fall through the cracks. And that might be the actual thing that's going to end up hurting that patient or uh, cost the system more because the long-term outcome is going to be poor. Uh, go ahead. So one, there are many studies that predict uh, primary care shortages. However, primary care Significant, is... Significant, like uh, 60,000 short yes, in the next yeah. 10 years or so. However, medicine is changing uh, and uh, we are moving toward a team-based approach. So there are actually some new studies that show that if you work in a team with your nurse practitioner, your, your uh, pharmacist, with your nurse, with your medical assistant, and you distribute some of those chores, then you will be able to increase capacity and try to prevent burnout from everyone who's trying to do this yes, race. Absolutely. And uh, the healthcare world is changing. We have uh, Obamacare, as just about everyone calls it now. How will that be a factor? And will it make it better, make it worse? Or do we know? Well, well I, was, I, I think one important thing about o Obamacare that you know, regardless of your politic, is that for the first time we begin to redistribute some of the resources to the idea that you don't have to get sick. Most of the discussion so far this evening starts with illness as a given. But we know, and a lot of the work that nursing dedicates its science to, is to keep people in a preventively well state. We're, we like to present ourselves um, in school systems um, we'd like to present ourselves in other scenarios other than the sickness system where people have to come to us. So we go to where people are at. And I think that's one of the unique features of, of broadening who's considered a primary care provider to include nurses is frankly that we do have somewhat of a different lens. It, it does deal with illness disease really, diagnosis and treatment, but it's also how do people live with that illness and, and that's part of our science and health promotion and health maintenance and care coordination is something we have had a long history of performing. You're a nurse practitioner, James, you're nodding your head, what are you thinking? There's a, is there more that you, you feel like you could be doing that you're not allowed to do? Or, or what? Certainly, I mean there are obviously tremendous restrictions on nurse practitioners and on physician assistants throughout the country. Missouri is one of the poorest states. Uh, when it comes to uh, the scope of practice, things that we're allowed to do, the autonomy we're allowed to hold. Uh, part of the coordination of care, I think, that Dr. Miller's talking about is very important. Uh, if she could hand off a patient with severe and complex chronic illness that just needs management, uh, weekly, monthly, uh, every three months, that's a tremendous effort because if we could bring that patient back into the office, monitor them, make sure that, for instance, that their A1C is not uh, every three months going crazy uh, if they're a diabetic, then we can adjust those things. And in the long run, the cost will be lowered for that patient and the outcome will be improved because we're managing them and monitoring them more closely and through the health literacy, they have a better hold on what on their understanding of the condition. So it, whether it's between a physician and a nurse practitioner or between new, two nurse practitioners, that coordination of care is, is, is critical. He's kind of going through the solution area. What other solutions should we be looking at? Yeah, there's a number of them. To, to bring it back to uh, Obamacare and the impact, um, Obamacare is based on kind of what Massachusetts did in 2006 and we know from watching Massachusetts over the last several years that the need and the demand for primary care went up dramatically they didn't have enough physicians they couldn't get people in they had a real problem with that and so we're not going to be able to graduate enough people from medical school fast enough to do this we absolutely need what's being talked about now we need team care we need we need Mike to get on the ball and turn out some more nurse practitioners for us and we, we need to develop teams of people who are integrated and will work together to, to allow for that capacity. So we can get high quality, we can keep the costs down, but people actually get better care. Okay, I gotta stop it there for one second uh, because we have the Twitter feed that is starting to get hot and we wanna check in with what you're saying online.
Okay, let's go outside of the studio for our next segment. We're going to go uh, west to where the sun is probably still up, and I'm sure the weather is perfect because we're headed to Los Angeles with Lisa Zamoski, uh, consumer health columnist with the LA Times and also a health reform expert for WebMD. Uh, we were starting to inch outside of our, our, our borders here when we brought up Massachusetts, but first I'd just kind of like to ask you generally, how do you see this issue playing out across the country? Is this something other states, I presume, are, are dealing with as well? In terms of a shortage of, of primary care? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, as, as your guests uh, already cited, there's no question that there has been a shortage. It's a long time coming. And um, the expectation is, or the concern is, that a combination of factors, you, you mentioned the Affordable Care Act, which is, uh, is obviously coming and, and implementation will be uh, complete in, in 2014. An aging population, you have a, a growing, um, you know, complexity in terms of chronic care that primary care physicians uh, need to deal with. And so it does vary by location. Uh, some areas, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic tend to have more primary care physicians than say in the South. Um, but the other issues to access, I think that came up that are important to mention, do deal with the Affordable Care Act and the fact that there are a number of barriers, which uh, again, I think your guests alluded to, uh, making it difficult for people to access primary care. Cost, for example is a major one and uh, you know the Affordable Care Act does potentially uh, does give access to primary care and to other medical services for people who have either not been able to get insurance or who have had difficulty affording insurance or going to primary care or getting preventative services. So is this um, going to overwhelm the system even more if more people have access and we're not graduating enough doctors who want to be a primary care physician for instance? I think that it is absolutely one of the factors that does threaten to overwhelm our system, yes. And, uh, and so we do have to start thinking about alternatives, as, as you've been talking about throughout the show. Uh, and the Affordable Care Act does, uh, incidentally, um, you know, support some of those things. Uh, it does, does encourage and start to shift the financial incentives as well for uh, the medical system to try and be more focused on primary care and to pay primary care physicians as well for things that they're not currently compensated for, like care coordination and care management, which is so important. Besides people who don't have access now trying to get access, what about people who do have access? You know, you hear some fears out there. Are, are they well-founded fears that as more people come in, I may lose access to my doctor, for instance? Mm -hmm. I think that what, what we've seen, and I, I, I believe it's the case also in uh, somebody referred to Massachusetts, um, the answer is it's, it's possible, but I think that uh, probably if you have an existing doctor, it's unlikely that you're going to be kicked off the panel. I think it probably will be more challenging for new patients coming into the system. Um, and, you know, there are, there are situations, and we haven't seen all of the health plans uh, obviously released in the new marketplaces yet, but uh, there are incidences, for example, here in California where uh, some of the networks of providers are much more limited than perhaps uh, some of the plans being sold today, and that can have an impact on your access to the doctors you want to see. You, you mentioned Massachusetts. Can we look at Massachusetts where they have a very similar law and see uh, how this is playing out as it pertains to primary care and, and kind of extrapolate to the rest of the country? Well, I think that, that Massachusetts is, is unique in a number of ways. I mean, one thing for sure that, that makes it unique is I, I believe it has the, the highest uh, number of, of primary care physicians per capita than any other state in the country. Um, but, you know, there is no question that, um, as one of your, your guests mentioned, that there have been, uh, you know, some issues with access. Interestingly enough, um, the, the Massachusetts Medical Society recently released a survey. They've been tracking this since the law went into effect in 2007. And it looks like an internal medicine and, and family medicine that, uh, you know, the wait times, they take a look at wait times, and they've fluctuated quite a bit over the years in those two, uh, two professions, but they've remained relatively static. But it's, it's a long period of time, and it, it varies throughout the state, but uh, it's about 52 days they report, or excuse me, about 50 days today. Um, compared to 52 in 2007 and, and about 39 days today to get into to see a family, uh, family practitioner. Um, but fewer of them are accepting new patients, and so that, that is a concern. Lisa Zamoski, thank you so much for your time uh, coming to us from Los Angeles. We appreciate this, uh, your perspective, and thanks for being on the show.
Thank you. Okay, let's go back to social media and see what's going on there. We asked you how you think the ACA will impact you and your primary care. My doctor's office used nurse practitioners also, which I fully trust. I think they may be used more in other offices as they will be less expensive. Hopefully, ACA will lead to a more level field instead of cost-driven care. I think it will have little direct impact on me, but may impose additional burdens on doctors, which may intrude on time available for patients. The Affordable Care Act will allow me to see my primary care doctor and the multitude of other doctors I need without worry. I won't have to weigh the cost of my health against my health. My insurance has a high deductible, so I try not to go to the doctor if I can avoid it in order to save money. I'm primarily concerned about the ACA driving up the cost of my insurance. Okay, it's kind of been a, a thread throughout the night, the Affordable Care Act, and we've heard some more there in the uh, Public Insight Network responses. So let's talk about it here at the table. I'll do some introductions. Mark Gorn, attorney with Paul Sonelli, and James Brassfield, chair, professor of management and health services, Webster University, and Rob Frund, friend, sorry, uh, I apologize, Regional Health Commission. Uh, let's start with maybe Medicaid expansion in Missouri. We know that has not passed. Uh, how does that play into this issue of primary care that we're talking about tonight? Uh, Medicaid expansion is the heart of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, without Medicaid expansion in Missouri, uh, our state stands to lose over $4 billion, that's with a B, uh, in funding over the next several years. Without those funds that are available, um, our health care systems will simply not be able to sustain themselves and provide the level of care they've been uh, providing in the past, uh, primary care included. Um, and we will see several of our community health centers that take care of folks in rural areas and in our urban core um, have severe loss of funding and severe loss of access. On the flip side, if we do expand Medicaid, we have the tools available, the funding available to do some really creative things to improve access in different models in different ways uh, and really make health better for our state. We, we heard, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm just going to say that, that primary care is kind of the bedrock of, of the whole health care system. And, and it's, it, primary care doesn't exist or doesn't exist in the same way for people that don't have some kind of financial access to health care. And as Rob said, the, the, the ACA was built around the notion that about half the people who are currently uninsured that would be covered would be through Medicaid and unfortunately the Supreme Court uh, threw a curve to the uh, to the law by giving states the option and that plus the the kind of poisonous politics of, of Washington and and many states has has led states uh, to many states to say we don't want Medicaid expansion even though that's obviously a key element in trying to get everyone or nearly everyone uh, having some kind of financial coverage so they can get into the primary care system, and which is the gateway to other aspects of, of uh, uh, health care. Dr. Miller talked about from her office that other states will actually recruit doctors to fill their need out of a state that doesn't expand Medicaid. Have you, have you, have you heard of this before? Have, are you I, it? I have not, but I, it, we're, it certainly we're makes, it today. It, it makes sense yeah. uh, because there's, there's obviously a a national shortage of a number of people. I mean, we get about 30 percent or 30, 35 percent of our total physician population engaged in in primary care. If you went to England or Germany or someplace else, it'd be 50 percent plus. And so, if you went to 1946, the United States, it would be 50. That, that's right. Yeah. You've got many of the incentives that are included in the Affordable Care Act that essentially are funded and then driven through vibrant Medicaid systems in the states to the extent that the states don't expand the Medicaid, 
much of the benefit on the care side is going to be lost to those states who don't participate. Is, is the primary care physician role changing or, or, or who is a primary care provider changing uh, with the Affordable Care Act? The, the Affordable Care Act really, I think, empowers primary care doctors and puts them in a position that may be as strong or stronger than they've ever been before in the context of what the care continuum is. Um, they are supposed to be the access point. Uh, the government has encouraged um, that relationship, the criteria to become a participant in an ACO. ACOs have to have some minimum number of beneficiaries that are covered. Those beneficiaries typically tie into primary care doctors. So the primary care doctors really represent essentially the passageway and the hub of the wheel. Are they ever going to get that hour back with that first time visit and 30 minute with the follow up or is it going to stay at about 15 like Dr. Miller said? It's probably going to stay both because of the shortage and because of the, of the money involved. I remember when I was a kid growing up in the 50s one of the, one of the top TV shows was Marcus Welby. And he was, a I was kind, you were a kindly. Say, I thought you were going to say Dr. Ben Casey. <laughs> ben is my first name, but go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and uh, you know, I mean, he was the the model of a primary care physician. Well, we're probably not going to ever go back to the days when, when we're being cared for by a by a Marcus Welby. That that is more likely to be teams of people that include physicians, nurse practitioners, and other uh, other kinds of medical personnel and physicians not having. A single office practice, but be in in more of a of a group kind of setting for not only a better provision of care, but also a better life. You know, I mean, what the the side of the Marcus Welby's that you didn't see was that they were on call 24 hours a day and and uh, had a uh, did a good job, but also had a difficult life. And that the whole medical world is a whole lot more complex. It's you know, Marcus Welby knew everything, uh, and it's hard for, for a physician to do that today. Something we haven't talked about are the exchanges. Do I, will the exchanges help in, in, specifically in this area or, 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 or not? Probably not. I mean, the exchanges are designed to try to make it more efficient uh, to, for an individual purchasing health care or a small business purchasing health care uh, to, to deal with a variety of insurance companies and get the best deal and, and to the extent that it enables more people to afford uh, health care uh, insurance and therefore they would have financial access that will help uh, you know feed the, the money into the primary care uh, primary care system but directly the insurance exchanges I think are okay are we not. have to we have to leave it there for right now because we want to get back over to Ed Ed can you please fill us in on social media what's what's going on right now well, Casey, a lot of the conversation about prevention, about access and how to find primary care physicians. So a lot of links, a lot of resources. We're going to put that actually on our website, which we will actually also include our post show. So please, uh, after this broadcast, you could log on to 9net.org slash stay tuned and actually join in, continue in a post show. We bring back all the guests. And so keep up your conversation on Twitter and Facebook. Let's see what you're already and continuing to say. Our community table tonight is particularly well informed on this specific topic. Let me do some quick introductions back to the show. Nick Semenkovich, MD, PhD candidate. Thank you so much for being here. Nadia Martin, Masters in Health Policy. Thank you for being here. Chris LeBeau, welcome back. Healthcare strategist. 
Um, I'm going to pick on Nick, and then we'll see where the conversation goes from there. You're going to be a doctor someday, Nick. How badly? If I ever graduate. If you ever do, well, I'm sure, unless you spend all your time saving the world. Uh, any interest in being a primary care physician? How appealing is that? For me, I think it would be difficult because I also like to do a lot of research, and that um, tends to happen in large academic medical centers, places like WashU, where there are huge labs established. Uh, you know, a lot of your guests today talked about things that were kind of depressing. It got me a little down. There are all these big problems. But I think that's uh, those kinds kind of problems open the door to such exciting solutions. And I think there are a lot of possibilities to attract uh, people like my classmates and myself into primary care. Uh, you know, one of the things that came to mind when your guests were talking is uh, actually in Kansas, they've done something really innovative. So uh, they realized they were running out of primary care physicians. So they actually established a medical school in Salina, Kansas, kind of smack dab in the middle of Kansas. And they started recruiting uh, students who grew up in rural Kansas to come and practice medicine there. And so they figured that if they train uh, rural physicians, people who go into family practice, practice in the area where they're going to practice, they're likely to stay around. And I thought that was a really cool, innovative solution. Um, I think the other thing that excites me about primary care, <clears throat> as we hit a real technology boom in this country too, is that how can we use technology to empower people like nurses, technicians to do jobs that primary care doctors previously once did. There's a real territorial issue there, but the bottom line is, is that there are certain aspects and services a doctor can provide that in the end will be able to be delivered and enhanced through technology that other people previously could not have uh, done with, with, with such training. Yeah, I think that's one thing that's lost in this discussion. You know, a lot of times we think that the primary care physician is the person you go to right when you're sick, but it's also just the person you can ask any general question about your health care to, or you know, the person when you're a little worried about something you ask, and it's important just to be able to reach someone on the phone. You know, one of the things that's always a little depressing to me is when you see people that uh, wait in a, a clinic for just prescription refills. And so they've gone, you know, out of their day, they may have had to take some time off work, sit in a waiting room for an hour or two or more because everyone's busy, wait to see the physician, see the physician and say, I'm just out of this pill, I just needed a refill. You know, that's kind of a, a failure that I think could be solved in one sense by, by improved technology and, right. and access to different levels of care, where if you have something that's just simple and approachable problem like that, we can get that taken care of real quickly. And really improve healthcare in that sense. But I think also in that aspect that comes with education because a lot of people don't understand the background that physicians have. They think, you know, I'm sick or I have to go to the doctor and they go. They don't understand that if you have a prescription that there are other ways that you can, you know, get a phone call and handle that. But for students that are, you know, in med school right now, hearing all this negative um, communication about, you know, being overwhelmed by patients isn't really um, enticing to want to be a primary care physician, whereas maybe it could be redir redirected to, you know, now that access is going to be available, helping and giving back rather than, you know, I don't want to follow that path because I don't want to be overwhelmed as soon as I get out of school. And, and let's be honest, nobody wants to go to the doctor. And part of the problem is, is that, you know, if you have a little bit of discomfort, this or that, immediately in your mind, it's, you know, don't, heaven forbid you look on a website like WebMD and suddenly you think you have something <laughs> way worse. Everyone right. has a but it's probably really yeah. the case. And Unless, of course, you read some of Lisa's work, then you will be that, highly informed from right. earlier in the show. We absolutely. just want to make that perfectly clear. Yeah, and absolutely. There, there's a great value of information out there, but it's trying to figure out what is relevant to me. And that's part of the problem is that patients, when they're feeling something, they're, cert they're uncertain, they're scared. And so the, the long-term question is, how can we use technology and other channels where a patient doesn't have to go wait in a doctor's office but can get some quick feedback on, you know what, my blood pressure may have just spiked a little bit. Maybe it's because I had too much caffeine or something like that, as opposed to schedule an appointment a week out to find out that there's nothing really wrong other than I need to reduce my caffeine intake or something like that. So. I find, I find it interesting that a lot of the attention is that, you know, once the this is passed that doctor's offices are going to be overwhelmed with patients, but I, I don't think the, the fear behind going to the doctor is going to change just because access is available. There's a lot of people that are scared to go to the doctor, um, partly from the bill, but also out of fear that, you know, if I go to the doctor, I may actually find out that something is wrong with me. That fear isn't going to go away just because it's available. So I don't think that this rush is going to happen right away. I think that there will be some time to transition, and then hopefully people will learn that prevented by going to the doctor, you can prevent a lot of these, th these things instead of waiting until it's so severe. 
Yeah, that's certainly a big issue. I think preventive care is something that we really don't do a great job at in this country. You know, there are not enough people over the age of 50 who just take something like a baby aspirin once a day. You know, you can go to the grocery store and buy over the counter a little aspirin to take. And we know that that prevents a lot of things, not only things like heart disease, but can actually reduce the risks of cancer if you take it for a long period of time. Uh, and, and that's something that as a country we just don't do a, a great job of. I think that improved access to care, and it doesn't have to be from a physician. It could be from a nurse practitioner. Right, it could be from a health educator. It could be anyone in the public health outreach realm. Any of those people can help contribute. It could be from technology. You know, people sure. watch tutorial videos online and learn how to take better care of themselves and uh, approach sort of preventive care, stop the problems before they really need to see a physician. But in the long run, this is, you know, one of the bigger Affordable Care Act issues, too, where our, our health care system is set up to where when you go through the ringer, that's when the doctor gets paid or when you show up at the hospital. That is when they, they, they're paid as opposed to paying, getting paid to keep you out of the primary That's care. That's how you get too office. many electrical outlets and too many faucets. <laughs> That's it. And too many cabinets. I knew yeah. that would work because I lifted it from someone else. All right. Thank you all very much. We have to leave it there for now uh, to go back to social media for one more check in there. We'd like to welcome back to the show Dr. James Kimmy, the former president for the Missouri Foundation for Health and with St. Louis University. Uh, thanks for coming back to the program. I know from last time, the best question I could ask you right now is, what did we miss? Well, it's not so much what we missed. We had a tremendous amount of information in these presentations, and I think it's very important to the audience to have a good understanding of primary care. Um, you know, I think in the first presentation, as mentioned, it's about relationships. And it was mentioned that it was about trust. And I think those are very important. But you know, you can have a relationship with the team. And several of the speakers talked about the team approach to primary care. And they have now what's called the Patient-Centered Medical Home. The Affordable Care Act is actually promoting that rather substantially. And in, the, in that medical home, you've got not, not only the physician, you've got nurse practitioners, you've got social workers, you've got care coordinators. Uh, you've got a variety of different people who are members of the team and so the individual who's going to the doctor relates to that team. Now the advantage for the doctor, because you talked about burnout later or earlier, the advantage to the doctor is that many things can be given to the team to do. So from the patient's perspective, they're in contact with a variety of people who have their interests. They're right in the center of this, but it doesn't have to be the doctor all the time. And so a lot of the follow-up, and this was mentioned again by some of your speakers, a lot of the follow-up can be done by some of the other members of the team. So the patient-centered medical home is, is important. But you also need, that needs to be in a medical or a healthcare community where you've got hospitals and specialists and you've got a public health department. And you begin to link these things together as a few communities in this country have done, not many, but a few have done it, where they've really linked public health, prevention, primary care, and then the rest of the healthcare system together to get a more efficient, effective way of taking care of people. Is there resistance to what you're talking about here? It's hard. It's complicated. It's not traditional. It's so not yeah, the way we've done it. It's not the way we've done it. You know, We've always done it the other way, and so that's the way we do it. But that's breaking down. And so we're seeing a lot more creativity right now, some of it driven by funding in the Affordable Care Act, uh, to really begin to try some of these newer, uh, different things. And I think the important, another important point that was made here is that good primary care is good quality care. And good primary care is less costly care. There have been studies done. There was a study done on one of these patient-centered medical home projects in which they demonstrated that the patients in that program were 18% less likely to be, in the hosp be hospitalized they were 36% less likely to be re-hospitalized, in other words, have this problem, and the costs were 7% less. Now, if we get those kinds of results across the country, 
in a big system like healthcare, seven percent savings not not shabby. That's pretty important stuff. I, I want to ask you if we should be yeah. thinking outside the box even more based on what we're seeing on Twitter. Are, are you're talking about how a team can provide that relationship? It doesn't have to be just the individual, but should we be th talking even more outside the box about what preventative care is? It, it, are, are parks? They're talking on Twitter. Parks, bikes. Uh, lifestyle things like sure. that is that is that something that should be in this health care conversation no, that's very much a part of the conversation and you know a, a well-established uh, medical primary uh, practice of the kind that we're talking about here the medical home the organized practice does preventive work they do counsel people about exercise they do follow their weight they do those things and it that's why you get this better quality output uh, from that kind of system so, okay so how do we get more uh, people, whether it be doctors or nurse, nurse practitioners, how do we get more people in the pipeline to do something about this shortage? Well, I think we've got a lot of people on the front line uh, who, as one of the panelists mentioned, the Practice Act in Missouri for nurses is very restrictive, one of the most restrictive in the country. We are not going to be able to have the traditional model of Marcus Welby, uh, one doctor per person. We've got to open it up and look to nurse practitioners, we got to look to physician's assistants, we've got to look to all of these people on the team to augment the primary uh, uh, practitioner, whether it be a physician or nurse practitioner. They need augmentation to prevent burnout. Okay, give us, uh, uh, let's stick with the uh, solutions theme. What else did you hear in tonight's show? What else would you, would you have liked to hear in tonight's show? We have about 60 seconds. Okay, I think one of the things we didn't hear much about is what a barrier insurance is to good primary care. The insurance system is based on fee-for-service and piecework. You touched on it in your introduction. And that's the way we do it in this country. That's a tremendous barrier, but that's the way the insurance companies drive it. They don't pay to keep people well. They don't pay physicians to spend a lot of time with patients. They pay service by service, test by test, and that's the way you run up tremendous costs to minimal benefit. To that's the not the market at work? That's not just how things are oh, naturally, the ha they're, they're, naturally no, no. happen? The market doesn't work in health care. Let's, let's face it, you don't have a choice. When you, when you need the health care and the medical care, you don't have a choice, so you don't have a market. Uh, I think that, you know, the market in healthcare is a myth. It's perpetuated by a lot of people who don't want to change the system, but it's not real. We'll leave it there because I think we're about to roll the credits. Dr. James Kimmy, thank Thanks. you so much for your, sure. for your perspective and for your expertise. And thank you for watching. For Ed Reggie, I'm Casey Nolan. Until next time, stay tuned. Okay, yes, we're back on the post show. Yes, mics are down here. Mics are down here. Stick mics down here. We're going to figure this out. Okay. Because last week we had some sort of like Mortal Kombat reality show over microphones. It was, it was entertaining, but I don't know if it was uh, productive. Um, okay, on that note, I have no idea what we're talking about. So, um, where did we leave off? Dr. Kimmy, any, anything else that I, you wanted to get out? there at the end that I didn't ask you or that I, you didn't have time for no, that. I think we didn't expand much on the insurance barrier to effective primary care, which is a real problem. And, I, uh, oh, and that's something we heard about in the Public Insight Network. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, and there's, there's a big change that's coming right now. So Wait, hang on, do you have a mic? Oh, yeah, sorry, there you go. That's there fine. Go. That's That's a big, there's a big change coming in the market. So as these exchanges are being set up, most of the exchanges are going to, to have as their primary plan benefits in which a, uh, a patient is insured 100% for their, their preventive medicine, then they have a $3,000 to $5,000 deductible, and then they're, they're insured for catastrophic health care needs above that. And what we're finding is a lot of health care, or a lot of uh, regular companies in St. Louis this year have already gone to that format with their employees, is that what happens is people, when they get sick, they'll, they'll go to the emergency room, they'll have you know, maybe a $1,200 or an $1,800, $2,000 bill, and you know, given the economy the last four or five years, the average family household doesn't have $2,000 sitting around to do that. And so people are having trouble paying these. And so we're gonna get into a situation, I worry, that, that they'll come in for their physicals maybe, or they'll be able to convince them to get their mammograms because those are covered. Um, 
But when they have diabetes and need to see us multiple times a year to keep that in tight control, they have other conditions that really does need care. It's going to be hard to get people in the door because they, they're, they're going to see all of that expense up front directly out of their pocket. That may, be, that may be a problem. Is this like a whole new donut hole we're talking about here? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> it's bigger than a donut, though. <laughs> and, and not delicious. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, someone, I felt like this, someone wanted to jump in. Well, it's not a slightly different topic, but I wanted to correct a misconception, which is that I absolutely love my job. Right. <laughs> I've been a primary care doctor for 10 years in St. Louis, and I have seen some of my patients are incredibly ill. I see them every month or every three months, so I've seen some of my patients 50 times, and I know them extremely well, and I have equally as good relationships with my nurse, my medical assistant. I have this incredible support team. I am so happy at work. It is exhausting, and I am breathless, and it is an adrenaline rush all day long. But um, being able to work within a community health center where I have a number of resources available to me under one roof is really enjoyable. So do we need more people like that talking to your classmates? We do. We need more people like that talking to my classmates. I think almost no one in my class went into primary care this past year, which is really a shame. Uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that, some policy reasons that we didn't really talk about in the show. The, the residency, uh, which is uh, actually paid for by federal government. So when you go and do a residency, the federal government pays your salary, actually allocates a certain number of slots for things like primary care and family practice specialties. And they have the power to maybe adjust those. And that's something that's that's been discussed. Um, I, I think there needs to be a lot more outreach into, into care. Another cool thing that we were talking about kind of between segments is the idea of a National Health Service Corps. This is another service that was actually just recently expanded under the ACA uh, that will basically pay for you to go to medical school in exchange for you serving time as, uh, that sounded bad, not serving time in that sense, uh, but you going into something like family practice. So you go in and work in an area that is an underserved region for uh, a time or time and a half. Uh, so if you went to medical school for four years, maybe for six years in those regions. And I think many of those physicians stay in those regions. D-R-O-T-C. Really exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm a National National Health Service Corps yeah. member myself, actually, and, and that's how I got to be with the People's Health Centers, as they were a designated site. Um, and a lot of people stay on, you know, once they've completed their their commitment, shall we say, um, to the National Health Service Corps. But uh, just like a lot of Teach for America folks become career teachers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. might not have otherwise. I have a, I have a uh, yeah, go ahead. question for Heidi. Why? Uh, Great, love the, the job that you're doing, but why do you think that uh, more of your colleagues who went to medical school with you didn't go the route that you did and went into specialty care and so on? Just just in case the mic wasn't picking up there, he was asking why did not more of your classmates take the path that you have? Probably money, probably a sense of like busyness. Um, I know that a lot of uh, professionals prefer to be an expert in one thing instead of having to feel like they need to be an expert on every single part of the body and any particular issue that a patient may bring to them. It's a number of reasons. I, I think that's fascinating because, you know, I really agree with you there. The complexity and the scope and the depth and the breadth of your practice is not, it, it really is easier to become reductionistic and focus on an organ mm -hmm. as the, as the, window to the soul, mm -hmm. and it is, it's not that way. But I still think that one of the challenges here when it comes to barriers is the scope of practice issue. And we didn't really have a lot of time to speak to that. What do you today. mean, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that physicians, because of malpractice and other concerns, they're in a position, in time constraints, they don't get to use the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they really possess. The same is true in this state, as was mentioned, with nurse practitioners. We train to national standards. We prepare people with a skill set, and then they go to other states to practice because we're so repressive in this state. And so I really think many health providers get international experiences even to go where they can really feel whole about what it is they're doing and contributing. So we've got to look at, at the barriers of malpractice, the, again, the legal aspects, the even human resource regulations just constrain us so much. We are such a regulated field that we don't get the freedom to do what we know we can do. Can, can, can we take that to the, back to the nurse practitioner? Uh, let's, I'm going to play Mike Czar. I'm going to hand one to, to, no, wait, no, one to James. We had an, an, an and we're sorry, Maria. Mike. Oh, you are Mike. Okay, James, is it? Yeah, here, let's, let me give you this one. So, so uh, we haven't, we've, we've talked about you like you're not here all night. So what's on your mind? <laughs> well, we're here, first of all. I think that physicians uh, in particular need to reassess 
we are, in a sense, in a crisis mode in this country, and we will be more so when the 36 million or however many million new people come on board with the Affordable Care Act. Anyone who's worked in an emergency room knows when something's going on, you look around and you say, who can do what here? Mm -hmm. Let's get this done. And we need to approach health care in that sense right now. We need to look around and say, who can do what? And if there's a nurse practitioner that can do something, if there's a medical assistant that can do something, we need to maximize their scope of practice. We need to maximize the skill set and the intelligence and the academic training that they have. Not minimize it, not restrict it. There are territorial issues, as one of the other panelists uh, discussed uh, tonight. And, uh, and for, for many different reasons. Uh, physicians don't want, uh, and, and many physicians and physician groups don't want nurse practitioners encroaching on their bailiwicks and yeah. on their territory. And uh, that's understandable. But uh, in the spirit, I think, of healthcare, in the spirit of healing people, we need to really start to appreciate what can we do and how can we do it better and how can we do this in an equitable and fair way. And I think it's important to point out, too, that no nurse practitioner is trying to say that they're a physician or that they're going to take the place of a physician. And, you know, there is some big misconception there. And, and I think that the focus really is on what we can do to enhance the system, what, what gap we can bridge that's there. How do we get more nurse practitioners? I, I, I believe I've read that it's, it's, there's, there are waiting lists to, to, to get into school for Faculty. This. So, <laughs> yeah, I oh, think. Sorry. I... Well, there are issues around faculty. I, the, the reality is um, there, are, there are waiting lists. There are people that start in their undergraduate level building their clinical experience and building their knowledge base. So by the time they get a master's degree, and some of them are working at it, I notice a doctorate of mm -hmm. nursing practice. These are very skilled people. They have a particular focus that they bring to the healthcare team. And again, a lot of it's around health promotion, health maintenance, living with disease. Um, again, so we get into debates around the supervision. Can a, a physician supervise every part? Well, no, because physicians aren't trained in all of those areas any more than nurses are trying to train and act as physicians. We're really trying to function as nurses. And that seems to be lost in the politics somehow, um, legislative politic, mm -hmm. because individually as we <coughs> around this table, we know there are co everyone's collaborative and everyone enjoys wonderful relationships no, that are respectful. Not me at all. Well, yeah. this is, this, uh, that's, that's, that's why I will not okay, let Ed sit at the post show table. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got just one comment since I'm a lawyer in yes, know, practice, so I have to say something. Um, <laughs> The Missouri legislature has recognized uh, that nurse practitioners do represent a very important part in what physicians do. Oh, here, and, hold your mic a little closer there, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, the, the legislature, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. The, the legislature has recognized that nurse pr practitioners uh, play a very important role, I think, both in terms of preventive care, in terms of the access point. Um, Missouri law has changed to allow nurse practitioners to essentially be, I guess, more remote from the supervising physician starting at the end of August this year. Uh, a very significant change, actually. It's significant until you come I just came from Oregon for, for five years, where for 20 years, nurse practitioners have been impaneled as independent practitioners. I'm sorry, this is repressive. The fact that this was the only state, when I stood at, in the Institute of Medicine at the National Press Club and had to talk about nurse practitioners in Kansas City, on the state line, they walk across the street. They're not allowed to function. That is not progressive. Mm -hmm. That is a repressive set of, of pre so I laud the change, but I cannot in any way support that this is in any way enlightened. And a good number of people here practice outside of what the repressive laws state and function more like they do in other states. But we are losing critical primary care providers to states that around us and we're ranked 37th or 39th in health problems in terms of disparities. This is absurd. So this is not progressive. That's, Hi, that's my point. That. Heidi, the, the recruitment you brought up from your office, and that was kind of new to a lot of folks. Tell us, expand on that if you would. If well, um, in 10 years, my nurse practitioners in my office have needed to interrupt me in the middle of a patient visit to have me sign a narcotic prescription. Um, they can't sign home health nurse orders without me signing it for them, and they can't make referrals without me signing for them. 
Um, that's not making the system more efficient. And in 10 years, I have never once seen a prescription, a home health order, or a referral that I disagreed with and gave it back to the nurse practitioner and said, reconsider. 100% of those were appropriate and I signed. And it's not a very good use of time or resources. For anyone. Perfect example, again, of constrained human resource. Mm -hmm. We have, and you, yeah. you have stated it beautifully, and I think we can't approve death either. We can't sign right. death certificates. It, it, it's absurd the, the kinds of things that we require physicians to do. Okay. That doesn't. Do We're that. almost out of internet streaming, and I, so go ahead. I just saw you reach for the mic, so I want you to just get, get on your uh, mic. What's on your mind? I, I would only say that working to the top of the license is really the, yes, and regardless of how a state yeah. looks at it, it's looking at this under the law and under regulation, and in Missouri. Physicians are the apex, and it, when something abnormal happens or goes wrong, it will ultimately revert back to the physician under the written collaborative practice agreement. So it's a matter of education. It's a matter of assuring the public that it's safe for f providers other than physicians to care for them. It's a team approach. I'm a strong advocate of advanced practice nurses. I've worked with tens of them. Uh, the, the point here is educating the public, doing what's safe, and making sure that we're providing the, the care that patients come to expect in a civil society. That's, that's what this is about, in my view. Mm -hmm.